you asked the Professor Lily Rowe. We are so excited to have her here. Um, the workshop is going to be very amazing. And um, before I introduce Professor Loeb, just a reminder that if you haven't joined our Slack channel, please do so in order to um, receive notifications, updates, and resources. And I would put the link in the chat right now. Great, so now please allow me to introduce our amazing speaker today, Professor Lori Loeb. Um, Professor Lori Loeb is in the Computer Science Department at Dartmouth College. She works at the intersection of art, design, technology, and society. She focuses on presenting information in ways that create an emotional connection to data in order to increase impact and motivate people to change behavior. Lori is the director of the digital arts uh, of the digital arts program, the co-founder and co-advisor of the Human Centered Design Minor, and the co-founder um, or faculty direct director of the Dartmouth Digital Applied Learning and Innovation Lab, which is more commonly known as Dali Lab. The films she worked on have won many awards, including two Emmy Awards and the Cena Golden Eagle Award. Her work has been screened at the Museum of Modern Art, the New York Film Festival, the London Film Festival, and the Whitney Biennial. Great. So, um, Professor Lori Loeb, um, yeah, we're, we're so yeah. excited. And, um, Thanks. I'm really, it's really fun to be with a group of women entrepreneurs and innovators. So, I think of myself as as a bit of an entrepreneur, I've started my own business. I've started these different programs and um, I love coming up with new things. I think, it's, I think it's really fun to experiment and see what we can do. So happy to talk to you about UI UX design. I am gonna share my screen. So just stop me along the way. If you have questions, uh, there's a workshop part at the end. So I wanna be sure we leave time for that. And this goes until six, yeah, that's, is that the plan? Yeah, great. So um, what is, what, what is design anyhow? What the heck is it? So, you know, a lot of people think about design is all about avoiding mistakes and that is true, but there's a lot more to it, right? As soon as any, everything we do, every choice we make is a piece of, says something about who we are, right? It's with a watch we wear, the clothes we wear, the color we paint our walls, everything we do is, an, is an, a representation of how we see the world and how we see the people around us. And it um, used to be in the old days <laughs> if <laughs> that form followed the function, right? With a lot of products, that is the case. If somebody saw a fork, a knife and a spoon and they didn't know what it was for, it wouldn't take them all that long to figure it out because the form of that object helps you to understand that the, you know, a fork might be to, to poke something and a spoon might be a way to funnel, to pull some liquid up and into perhaps into your mouth, the shape of the handle tells you it, it fits in your hand, the size tells you the same thing. But now, you know, as soon as in 2007, when this thing came along and suddenly, you know, a phone, this rectangle was no longer just a rectangle and it wasn't even a phone and it didn't even used to be, the phone part of it is the least good thing about an iPhone, in fact. It's, you know, it's our banking, it turns on our lights, it's the way that we communicate with each other with social media, it's how we listen to music, it's, it's every, it's so much more than these little, than the shapes, the function, when the function starts exceeding the form, then it becomes up to designers, user interface and user experience designers in particular, to help people understand how then to use those different tools that are there. So it's the window into how the device functions. In, it's the, it helps us understand the form and the function. So the magic of our devices, of our digital tools is the code, right? And, the, and, and you could think about it like a recipe. It's this really great recipe and this great chef puts together this amazing soup, right? But the part that we see in the front of the house is we notice the ambiance in the room and the and the and how we feel eating this, and the so the user experience is that thing of how it feels, and the user interface is the is the spoon right the way we get it to us, 
If we're a little kid, that experience is slightly different. If we're older, we or we use, you know, we're dipping it in bread, the bread becomes part of the interface. And if sometimes there's no spoon at all, right? So different users have different ways of getting that same exact soup and they have different needs for that same exact soup too. And so what user interface and user experience design tries to do is to help designers understand their user, the people who are gonna use the, the digital tools that we're helping to build. And in order to get help them get what they want help those people who are using our tools get the things that they're hoping for in the most painless delightful wonderful way right that's that's really the goal because when someone comes into a hardware store and they ask for a quarter inch drill bit they really aren't interested so much in the drill bit they really want to drill a hole when you go on to a travel app you're less interested in finding out which United flights fly to California. You want to get to see your beloved you know, family member who you haven't seen in months and months. That's what you care about. If the app could get out of the way, that would be ideal, right? If we could just you know, think about it. So that's, that's what user interface and user experience design is all about. It's not about helping us get the quarter inch drill bit. It's not about helping us buy the plane ticket. It really is about helping us get to see our beloved family member. It's about helping us get to our goals. That's why people use the tools that we build, design and build. And it's so important as innovators and, and entrepreneurs to be thinking about that, right? What is it that you're, what is it that you're creating that you is, that's different and special and important? And how can those digital tools provide that in the, most, you know, in the best possible way. So what is UX design? It's, it stands for user experience design. And basically that is the part of a design that deals with where things are placed, how things are navigated. So for Wikipedia, there's this side navigation bar, there are tabs at the top, there's the menu is up along the top, Two, there's little content boxes and windows. It usually is, you know, some information. And then down at the bottom, there is the, the reference material. It follows a similar form every page. And user interface design is the font that they've chosen, the image that was chosen to be there, the colors that they are using, the different colors for buttons, the shape of a button. Those are the interface pieces. So the experience is how do you navigate through this? And the interface is design part is the what, you know, what does it look and feel like? What's the spoon? So this is an example. So UX is where are these buttons? How are the products laid out? UI is what do they look like in the end? Is it a dark design? Is it light design? What, what's the color scheme? What's the font? So there are some rules for thinking about this and they're not that different from the rules of in, you know, interior design or any other kind of design. And so I encourage you guys to really start looking and that's what the workshop part of this is gonna be, to look around, like you look at this room and you instantly know this room was designed. Right, this wasn't just thrown away. Someone thrown together, someone thought about the room and why? Partly because there's alignment, right? The TV screen lines up with the side, the edge of the wall, which lines up with the, with the fireplace. There's a white space. There's a lot of empty space where there isn't something. Even if it's gray, it's still white space. There's open, empty areas. Every single piece of the wall is not taken up. There's consistency, right? Objects are repeated uh, throughout. So three little tables that sort of nest together. There's color, right? This, all the colors go together. You've got this very gray and white scheme, color scheme all the way through it. It's not just a hodgepodge of a millions of millions of colors. And there's repetition of design, right? The chairs are the same. The couches are the same in different position. There is, so these are all the same rules that we use in UI UX design.
to think about the design things that we're doing. This room looks so different from this one, right? How would you begin to know where what to do in a space like this? This looks like my space right now, um, but it's you know it still doesn't tell us how to navigate and how to make our way through it very well. It isn't a very pleasant experience that's moving forward when you're in this kind of a space. So there are some heuristics which are called which are the mean rules of thumb for design, and I thought I'd walk you through them quickly and then have you practice. Does that seem like a good plan? Any questions about what we've done so far, what I've said? Okay, most of this stuff you kind of know already. Um, so the first one, and maybe one of the most important is accessibility, right? Accessibility has to do with, can everyone use this tool, right? And will everyone use it as expected? So those are the questions. Now we know that everyone won't use everything. We, we as designers, either purposefully or accidentally leave some groups of people out, um, can't design something that anybody will use because some people have various um, physical and mental impairments that might keep them from being able to use everything we do. But that doesn't stop us from trying, right? That's got to be the goal is to be, understand how many different kinds of people can we work for and build for and how can we be as inclusive as we possibly can. It's so important. So accessibility, does it work? It also involves, does it work across platforms, right? Um, or is it only for the rich people who can afford an, an iPhone, right? Does it also work for an Android users? Not that Androids are, are cheaper or not as good. It's just that more of the world has Androids, right? A lot other parts of the world, in other parts of the world, more people have Androids. In the US, more people have iPhones. So you leave out a whole group of people if you just design for an iPhone. Does it work for people of all ages? What would a kid need? What would a senior citizen need that would might be different? And does it consider other languages, right? What are some of the language things that we're playing that we're sort of convinced or used, bought into? And then it, we have to think about the mental model of the user, right? How many times have you gone to a screen and tried to make it, you know, try to, to squeeze it, make it bigger, and it doesn't do it, like, because your laptop isn't a touch screen, but you're so used to touch screen. And the same thing is true for little kids, you know, if you're used to reading a book, you go to an iPad, and you, and you try to swipe it, and the other way around, if you're used to swiping and pinching, and, and you go to a book, and it doesn't do that, you don't necessarily know how to do it. So mental models are all about, I was talking about that in class, earlier today, they're all about what do people expect and what do people know when they come in. So we have to keep that in mind, right? Just like you have to understand who your customer base are in, when you're designing a business. Simplicity. So simplicity is one of the big ones, right? Here is a, an app for a Fender guitar and it's got all this fancy 3D stuff. And maybe it helps us understand that the Fender has a cool profile but it doesn't necessarily get me what I want, which is to buy that, have a guitar in my hand. It makes it harder. I have to navigate this thing. It's, it's just extra noise, right? It just fancy doesn't mean good. So remember that the perfect interaction is no interaction, right? If I could get to see my family in California without having to book the, the plane, I would. So don't put in, don't make it fancy just for the sake of fancy make it easy and simple because people aren't there to interact with your app. They're there to get something else done. So you have to keep that in mind at all times. Antoine de saint Expuri said, perfection is achieved not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away, right? Take away as much as you can. I had a teacher who talked about 25 years of simplicity, to get to simplicity. It took her 25 years. She had developed this, her own method and called the Rubenstein Synergy Method. It's still being used today. And, and she spent 25 years figuring out how to explain it simply, right? How to pare it down into the most essential elements. Much harder to make something simple than to make something complex. And that's why we often have this paradox of choice and things like there's so many different things we don't even know where to start. It's cognitive load, it, it hurts our brain when there are too many choices. 
in things. And that's what happens with feature creep, right? Oh, okay, well, somebody might want to do it this way. So let me give them that option. And they might want to do it that way. And we just start giving more and more and more features and suddenly things are no longer simple. They're quite complex. Maya is a perfect example of that, um, as Maria knows. So intuitive, right? Is it an intuitive product to use? And this is true whether you're doing a digital tool or a or a, you know, an analog tool, a product that you hold in your hand. Um, you know, do we know how to use it? Does it use some of the conventions that we have come to understand uh, along the way? And one of the things that people may not know about is that our eyes look at things in patterns, either in an F pattern or in a Z pattern. And so by designing in those F patterns or Z patterns, we follow the way that our eyes work. And you'll start noticing now F patterns and Z patterns everywhere you go, every single website. And that's part of the goal of this is to get you seeing things differently. Um, you know, Facebook, for example, consistency. So consistency across different platforms, across different pages within, um, within a site, right? So that we know that they go together, reusing, uh, images, reusing patterns, reusing ways that we function within that particular app, right? So that we know that they're just two different cities, two different times of day, but that this is clearly the same app, right? It feels the same. There's something really satisfying about that. When you go to a page within an app and it feels really different, you think you're lost, right? Oh, ah, there's a moment of panic. Feedback is another one. People want to know that they've been heard. And I don't know if the devices are getting much better at this, but for a long time, people forgot this. So you click something and then you click it again and you click it again and you click it again. And then you find out that you just bought 20 pairs of the same shoes, right? Because you didn't know you were clicking that, you, that it was working. So it's really important to give some kind of a response on a web app. It's, it's a hover state and then it's some sort of an, uh, a pushed state. Same thing with, a, with your thumb. You've got to show that you, it's actually been, been used or about to be pushed in some way, these things of showing, you know, you pick a choice, it turns blue, you add it to the card, it changes color, up comes a pop-up. Those things don't just happen by themselves, they're designed by somebody to give you feedback all along the way that yes, that's the one I chose. Yes, you added it to the cart. Are you sure? And are you ready to check out now? Lots of different ways to keep re reaffirming that this is what you've done and what you wanna do and how you wanna keep moving through. I think the most important one is, al is alignment. I'm an alignment nut. I care about it so much. I think it's just so important that things are aligned. There are different kinds of alignment. So this particular app has sort of these horizontal alignments, these different horizontal bars, but then there's a center alignment that kind of goes all the way through it. This is in the page, but then there are some pieces like that we work with more than a thousand leading uh, science, life science suppliers, that's left justified. And underneath each of these icons is left justified, but some things are centered because there's a basic center justification, some left alignment, um, some left and right alignment for these different apps and, and logos along the way, thinking always about the balance and how things are going to line up with each other and fit from the top too. We have things that are saying, this is center. It's all about look down the center of the page. And generally you want to have things be left justified for most things when you're talking about text because it just looks better and reads better. It is the biggie. There's all these different kinds of alignment that things can have and ways that things are aligned. And it's amazing how much time in my slides, I, when I'm doing slides, I spend hours and hours on just aligning my words. I don't use what Google gives me or what, PowerPoint gives me, I just redo all the alignment because it's just so important to get it right, you know, to get things lined up as they should be, right? How are you lining up your different objects? Some center justified, some left justified. That's okay, left alignment, center alignment. As long to mix those up, you use what works, but you have to pick, you have to pick along the way and do it very deliberately. 
um, use and their grids and tools in all of the design UI UX tools like Figma and Sketch and Adobe XD that help you line things up their grids. So you wanna use center in real modification, usually only for something small like this that is underneath a thumbnail. Spacing, so I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff at you. I realize this is going fast, but you'll get to practice it. So spacing is really important. I talked about white space when we looked at that room. It's a way of adding to subtract, right? You're gonna, if you notice websites, when you have things too close together like this, it doesn't, it seems like there's plenty of white space here, but look at how much better this looks. There's more white space here between the, his name and the words. The words have more kerning, more space between each letter. Each uh, line has more spacing between it and there's more spacing between the icons and it just feels better. So here are some examples of some websites that use a lot of white space um, in their designs. Right, a lot of white and gray, and then the little bit of blue to sort of take you through the story of what this company blue is all about. There's another one. This is a kind of um, beauty product, skincare treatments, a lot of white space. In fact, here you have white space until they populate it with a few um, product pages, product um, squares. And so then, you know, more white space. And again, even in some of these spaces, the use of, of white space is really important, but remember gray can be white. So this little bit, this little uh, rectangle that's underneath helps it feel like it's more designed than if it wasn't there. Just that bit of asymmetry that happens. Here's some feedback. Right, moving left, moving right. The, there's a rhythm to these. The choice of a font that is a serif font, meaning it has these little lines at the, at the edges to make it feel kind of warm and friendly, less modern, less mechanical because it's skincare products. So you have a uh, sans serif font for the buttons and for the, for the body text, but for the titles, they all have serif. Right, very carefully chosen um, as, as a design choice to make the, san, the serif looks warm and organic and friendly, even old fashioned, whereas the modern makes it easy for the text body makes it easier to read. Right, and continuing with the, the gray and then these kinds of buttons to say press here. And when you press there, takes you to another page with a lot of white space. Okay. Proximity is another important rule. Putting things, so white space is important. Putting things near each other is also important. If you want things to go together, put them near each other. There's a lot of psychology that goes into that to Fitz Law and some other things, but it also helps us understand it. This is kind of ugly looking. We don't know where to look. This is tells you, okay, Joe's Graphics. It's at, you know, on Lawn Hill Drive in Happyville. Here's the phone, here's how you reach them, right? Here's the name, here's the address, and here's how you reach them. So it, it tells a story, right, because of the proximity. Consistency is another rule of thumb. Um, making things, so in this case, if you have icons that are solid at the bottom, when they're, when they're just outlined up here, it's not consistent. So make sure that whatever you use, you use consistency in all the kinds of things that you do. Rhythm, this is a lot of stuff. This is what we all have to learn, all these things. Rhythm to give a sense of flow and movement and dynamism in, a, in an app, to take us from one place to another, really helps to give, to keep people interested and take us along, right? Sense of movement. Well, I'm almost there. These are only some of them too. Huh. Balance, 
right? So there's a golden ratio that can be used in design. Like you don't even notice this, but you notice if it's not there. So students who take my classes, they, you know, or who are designers, if you ever go to a restaurant with designers, it's just like so annoying because we spend the entire time critiquing the menu, right? Or looking at the, around the room, like what are they doing putting that picture there? Or that's not where, you know, like, what? Right. It's just, it's just amazing. You start noticing these fine, fine little things and you never go back, right? It's over. Once you start noticing it's over. So you're about to start noticing some more, right? These things that we don't even know go into it. You don't even think about alignment until something's poorly aligned and you don't even necessarily know why you don't like it, but you know, you don't like it. So if someone just moves things over just a little and aligns it, suddenly it feels right. It feels calm. Matisse used to talk about that. Henri Matisse, he would paint a painting and people say, when do you know it's done? And he would say, it's when I feel a sense of harmony in the work, when I feel calm, when I look at it. And that's what designers are trying to do is not make people feel anxious is stressed. You're trying to help people feel good in the process of getting to the thing that they want to get done, to get home, to see their family. So contrast helps us know what to push, right? So contrast in color, these are called call to action buttons. You wanna only have one on a page and it tells you, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna discover this now. Sometimes they have a shadow to make it feel like you can actually press it to give sort of what's called an affordance to give us a sense of what's supposed to happen with this particular button. You can use contrast in size, something really big to help us see it and pay attention to it. I'm sort of mixing UX and UI principles together. Open versus closed in terms of contrast. So lots of white space in here and then things that are really tight and closed in here. So you have a mix of things and shape, right? Using shape to give a sense of contrast between things that are small and things that are big, like to give a sense feel of things. Helps us know where to look and what to look at. So when you think about Spotify, which is something when I ask students about in US, CS25, the UI UX design class, like what, what apps do they like or websites, they often mention Spotify, right? So if you think about Spotify, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of product. It's a real product page that is dark design. Um, you know, your, your library on the side, you, there's a scroll bar here. These things scroll in a different sort of way. Here is how you, um, the pages that go into creating a new playlist. So if you think about the flow through this, App. This is the UX of Spotify. Right, you go through and you click add and then you can refresh your songs and it does recommendations. You can look for some more. Right, so all these pages and all these interactions are designed to help you get through and get what you want, which is a playlist. And there's a lot there. There's a lot of steps involved. From the little buttons that tell you that are like breadcrumbs, there's more to click here. Um, and, and to the side, things at the side, the little plus signs, all these things help us understand how we're supposed to use that uh, object, that, that digital tool to get the things that we wanna get. So what I was thinking that you guys could do, um, I think there's enough that we could do a couple of breakout rooms. There's 13 people. So uh, three breakout rooms of four each and um, go into the room. What I'd like you to do is think about actually, what was the last app or digital tool you used? What was the last one you used, anyone? all of you, like Daria, what did you use last? 
Um, my clock app because it's the morning in Tokyo, and so I just woke up and no, oh, yeah, had to um had to turn off my alarm. So <laughs> the clock app was what I used last. Okay, Ariana, right. what did you? <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. That's perfect. Ariana, what did you use last? Snapchat. Okay. Eleanor? I use iMessage. Okay. Sophia? A Gmail app. Okay. Maria? I use Slack. Slack. Okay. Beta? Vita? I use Spotify. Spotify. Ning Ning. I use calendar. Okay. Mia. Uh, Venmo. Venmo. All right. Mm -hmm. Pushing money around. Rachel, what did you use last? Are you, if you're there. Or Sam. You may be. Um, I used Gmail. Gmail. Okay. So those were the apps that you were used. Take a moment that you use, take a moment and think about what were you trying to accomplish, right? One, you were trying to get up because you had a thing that you were hosting, right? Or I, you know, what, what were you actually trying to get done? What was that thing you were trying to do? And then what I was thinking is you go, let's go into breakout rooms and I'd like you to go through, pick one from the four of you and go through it with new eyes together you can share a screen um, or, or look at the phone together. And I'd like you to think about all those things I talked about, alignment, consistency, simplicity, uh, white space, um, rhythm, contrast, accessibility, um, cons consistency, I may have said that one already. All of those different uh, things, terms and feedback, and look at the app with these eyes, right? With those terms, thinking about those, what is it about the app that you're looking at that makes it work? Like what kinds of things are at play in each one of those pages? And see if you can't discover, think about that app in a new way. And when you're finished with one person's app, you could try another person's app, but we'll take, it's 5.35, I wanna have time to come back and talk about it. So we'll take like, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, we'll come back at 545. So 10 minutes to sort of go through the app, pick, quickly pick one, and then 10 minutes. Um, can I create breakout rooms? Oh. Um, yeah, I can actually. So we'll make three breakout rooms. Um, okay, so we'll see you in the breakout rooms. We'll come back in at 545 and report back. Does that sound like a plan? Perfect. Cool. Okay, great, here we go. Back. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice to see you guys again. How was that? Good. So it would be great to hear uh, from different, from any of you, and you know, like what surprised you? Was there, were there some things that you noticed in a new way that you hadn't noticed before about the, whatever it was that you were looking at? Uh, using these, by using some of these different um, heuristics that principles that I talked about. And what were they? And just, you could just talk out loud, no calling you, we're not in class. I've been in class all day, I've done. Let's just have a conversation. What did you notice? What surprised you? Disappointed you, whatever. When we were talking about Gmail, I, I don't really know where this would go under, but I thought it was really interesting, like the double use of some um, parts of the app. So like when all of the profiles are aligned on the left-hand side, if you hold down on a message or anything like that profile then turns into like a check mark or something else that you can use to either delete a message or forward it, which I honestly don't think I realized before either, but just from like holding down in different ways, um, figuring that one out is pretty cool. Yeah. Nice use of the real estate and you're looking at the profile anyhow, and then it gives you the next action, right, mm -hmm. uh, to do. So that's great.
Um, we talked about Venmo and something that I hadn't really, I guess, put together beforehand, but Veda pointed out was like the amount of white space and just like how it was green for like adding money or when you're doing a transaction to someone red, um, it like lessens the cognitive load and that makes sense because it's money and that's something people really care about. So you want almost like as simple as possible, I feel like of a design um, and also helpful features that Venmo has like, oh, like, do you really want to make this purchase or trans or sorry, this like transaction or, hey, like, do you need help finding friends or doing this? And so I guess I hadn't really thought about like the implication of how simple of an app it is because you're dealing with something so important, which is your bank, like connecting to your bank account and exchanging right. money. And what do you think the simplicity, so you say, because it's banking, does that make you feel more secure? Does it make it feel easier? What do you, what does that simplicity give you in that out of I curiosity? Think, so personally, I think like looking at it now, yes, simplicity, but also it makes it feel more formal or like, um, like it's not like it's a frilly app with fun colors and designs or et cetera. Like it makes it feel like it's more legitimate, I think, in being um, so, uh, like in, in being so straightforward, it makes it feel like it's more legitimate in what I'm trying to deal with. I guess that's the feeling I get as a user. Um, so then I feel overall better about using it as a platform to connect to my bank account and to exchange money on. Mm -hmm. I think nice. so. Um, I was part of the Venmo discussion, but we also talked about how there's a lot of like feedback features. And so part of that security, um, especially when you're dealing with money, like, you know, can, are you actually going to make this transaction like, and then you receive, say, like an email or a screen that says your transaction has been made. Um, and just receiving that feedback is definitely calming too, <laughs> and just another added layer of security. Right, because if you don't get the message, then you know it hasn't happened. Or if you get a message that you didn't actually initiate, you know how to respond. And so they give you feedback in multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. And confirm it. Yep. Good observation. Um, my group kind of talked a lot about GroupMe and how it kind of implements like basically everything we talked about. Um, it's pretty simple and very intuitive, um, and it just like reads well, like how your brain would naturally read. Um, and then there's like the search feature. And one thing I didn't actually say in when we were talking, but like on the sidebar, there's like not that many options. There's like a chat, like contacts, and then like a couple other things, but I feel like there could be like so many like overloads of different features, but they like stuck to like the basic core thing, which is just to like have this communication system. Um, and it uses like nice color and like a lot of white space. It's mostly just like the blue from the logo for um, the different icons. And with that, we also talked about its accessibility, like you can have massive groups of people using different platforms and still communicating on the same like interface. So like if you have someone older who doesn't like use a smartphone or whatever, they can do it on a desktop um, or you can use I iPhone, Android, you know, whatever anyone's using. Yeah, which is one of the beauties of GroupMe, right? It's just this really easy tool that people use for all kinds of communications between groups um, and all ages. It's, it's, it's a really interesting application. Yeah, we also found um, Gmail, the Gmail app has a compose button um, at the lower right. So um, it's very intuitive. And since writing email is one of the most important functions of Gmail, um, it's very, it, um, it like makes the user um, experience better. So like um, the users will feel that it's easier to use the app. And, um, and also maybe it's because we usually hold our hands this way and we use our thumb to click the buttons. So actually like this button is the easiest to like click on. So it's pretty fun. And um, the Gmail app is also um, like, 
it doesn't have a lot of excessive features, which is really nice. And yeah. Nice. Any other observations? Anything you didn't like that you thought they could, did you notice things could be better? Um, there's one thing about Snapchat that I brought up with my group that I just thought was interesting because I feel like it's a pretty big feature that you wouldn't really know about without trial and error that if you send a Snapchat and you wanna delete it before the other person sees it, you can hold down and it will like pop up with an option for you to delete the message. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's something that it didn't used to have. And I personally never knew like when they put it in, I just found it one day, but it seems like a pretty big thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm shocked. I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't I, I know. I had like, I found out this week and I had no idea. I wonder how long that's been there. Yeah, let me know if you find out. Really interesting. Yeah, so, you know, we're trying to send messages to each other. We're trying to send mail. We're trying to put groups together to, to figure out, you know, when to do things and where to do things. We're trying to listen to music. We're trying to say, share money between people. There's so many things that we're doing on, on our digital tools. And it is, it's just the, the look and the feel of it suddenly, you know, like someone designed every single thing <laughs> that you look at and every single page and every single interaction and time and thought went into each one of those because there's so many different choices that people could have made. You know, with Venmo, the whole idea, there's PayPal and there's Venmo. Now there's more different ways you can transfer money. But, you know, young people first started using, you guys use Venmo. Like you, you probably, like I, I now use Venmo all the time and I can't believe I didn't use it sooner. It's just so great for now. I, it's someone asked me for actually to give them money and I'm like, what, what? what? Are you kidding? <laughs> it's just so great. And I felt, and I think that thing of feeling comfortable, feeling secure is an important piece of it because banking is a big deal. I, I'm giving over information about my bank account. I have to trust that and sending money to someone. I have to trust that they got it. Um, and when it says it's initiating a transfer, I have to believe them. Like there's so many things that we have to believe about these apps and trust so how do you build that? How do you build that in? And what are the things, um, the ways that that uh, designers are making things fluid and easy and fun to use? It's just you know, giving you the sense that you can delete something after you send it probably makes you feel better about <laughs> about some of the some of the messages that you that you send or snaps or whatever you call them. Um, and I. Yeah, it, once you start looking, there's no turning back. Um, the UI UX layer is the communication layer between the developers and the user. That's all they see. That's all a user sees. They don't see the code, right? Not at all. All they see is this UI UX layer. So, and all the people that go behind that, the people who came up with the idea, the business people, the marketing people, the, you know, the, developers, everything, they have to trust that the de designers have done their job right. Because if they haven't, it doesn't matter how great the idea is, it's not going to be used. We've all experienced that, the bad app that we just don't want to come back to. It's unpleasant. So um, super important to be thinking about. It's the rocket science of digital tools. Just trying to convince that, trying to convince a software engineer of that is pretty hard to do. But they're starting to get it <laughs> more and more. So um, thanks you guys for uh, letting me come and talk with you and meet with you. I'd love to hear more about you all. I know some of you, but I'd love to hear more about what you're up to and um, yeah, why this club and what excites you about it and all of that stuff. I don't know that we don't really have time, but sometime I'd love to just come and chat with you, just hang out because seems like a really important group. And as I say, I care deeply about women and 
innovation and entrepreneurship and there's not enough women in entrepreneurship drives me crazy. I've been fighting hard with the Magnuson folks about some of the things that happen there to try and increase the number of women engaged. So let's keep working on that. Let, let me know if I can be of help with, with your efforts. Thank you so much, Professor Love. We would obviously love to have you. And yeah, thank you for today. It was so, so insightful. And yeah, I'm sure everybody um, had an amazing time and learned a lot. And yeah, we'll never <laughs> look at an application the same way again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, you guys. Have a good, have a good um, Friday, a good evening. And I'll see you, see you another time. All right. Bye. Thank you.